Hello everyone. Would you treat your patient with a Lipsheriata with a JAK inhibitor? Would you choose a certain JAK inhibitor over another? Are there any safety concerns? There are so many questions about JAK inhibitors. I decided to make a short video today to give you an update what is known and what is the future, possible future, of JAK inhibitors in Lipsheriata. This is how Lipsheriata starts. In most cases, there is one patch which has no hair, two hairless patches, sometimes more. Sometimes they become confluent and form bigger areas with no hair. And in extreme cases, there will be Alopecia totalis or Alopecia universalis with no hair at all, as in the last case in this image. Our decision about whether or not to treat a patient with a systemic treatment will depend on the SALT score. The SALT score measures the severity of alopecia areata and it stands for severity of alopecia areata tool. This is a simple scoring system which allows evaluating the percentage of scalp hair loss. So if we have a patient who has 100% of the scalp area covered with hair, then this will be a SALT score zero. Whereas if we have another patient and the patient has 50% of the scalp area covered with hair and the other 50% is covered with hairless patches, then this will be salt 50. And finally, in a patient with alopecia totalis or universalis, this will be salt 100. And whatever the percentage is in an individual patient, we will give this a certain salt score. So what is severe alopecia areata? It is believed that if the salt score is 20 or less, then we can say that this is a mild form of alopecia areata because in most cases the patient can cover the hairless patches with the remaining hair. If it is more than 20 but up to 49, we will say that this is moderate severity and the severe alopecia areata is salt score 50 or more. And in cases of moderate and severe alopecia areata, most of the experts believe this is an indication for systemic therapy. So when we talk today about the systemic JAK inhibitors, we would usually have in mind the patients with moderate severe alopecia areata. Most of us know what the term JAK stands for. It stands for genus kinases. And the genus kinases are kinases which are responsible for transmitting the inflammatory inflammation to the cell. And there are four of them. It's JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, and TIK2. And it is quite important that they are quite different different because depending on which genus kinase we block, we may have a somewhat different effect on the cell and on the body and a somewhat different possible adverse event. This is a simplified illustration of how it works. These are three pro-inflammatory cytokines and they have an effect on the cell and on the body via the JAKs. And every cytokine will work or will have an effect on the cell via a different set of JAKs. So for example, if we use a JAK3 inhibitor and we decrease the activity of JAK3, then we will achieve the effect of decreased interleukin-2 activity on the cell and we will have a minor or no effect on other cytokines. We can roughly divide the JAK inhibitors into two generations. The first generation are the JAK inhibitors, which are inhibiting two or more JAKs. And the second generation, these are JAK inhibitors, which are more selective. They are not purely selective in most cases, but they're more selective and they can decrease the activity of one of the JAKs. So what about JAK inhibitors in Lipsheriata? It started a few years ago with a very enthusiastic phase when we observed that patients who received JAK inhibitors had a hair regrowth. One of the first patients in whom this phenomenon was observed was this 25-year-old man. He was treated for psoriasis with tofacitinib and what was observed was that he had full hair regrowth. There were then more studies which showed the efficacy of JAK inhibitors, mainly of tofacitinib, because this was one of the first JAK inhibitors available. Also, another one was ruxolitinib. There was even an idea, and I think it's still valid, to use JAK inhibitors in the topical form. This may be an indication, especially 
in children with alopecia areata. The first two JAK inhibitors which were available was topazitinib and ruxolitinib, and there were some studies showing that they may be effective in patients with alopecia areata, but it was always off-label treatment. And now, finally, there are advanced clinical trials which show that at least three JAK inhibitors may be approved for the treatment of alopecia areata. And then, from the phase of enthusiasm, we were switched to the phase of uncertainty. What raised significant concern was that there was a warning of the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, the FDA, about the increased risk of adverse events with some JAK inhibitors. It was indicated that three JAK inhibitors, tofacitinib, baricitinib, and upatacitinib, may be associated with an increased risk of some adverse events, such as cardiac adverse events, cancer, thrombotic events, and even cases of death. And the FDA indicated that that we as doctors should be cautious when initiating the therapy with these drugs in patients who are more than 50 years old and especially if they have at least one risk factor for cardiac diseases such as for example hypertension. The phase of concern was followed by a phase of more in-depth analysis and some optimism. Some of the experts did not share the point of view of the FDA and even indicated that maybe there was not sufficient grounds for such a warning. I think that maybe what will turn out that uh, some JAK inhibitors will have a quite narrow therapeutic window, meaning that if the dose is lower than the perfect dose, then we will have no efficacy. And if it is higher than the perfect dose, then we will have an increased risk of adverse events. And we will need to find the perfect dose either for every patient or for every group of patients. There are, of course, no head-to-head -head data to compare these three drugs which are currently in development for alopecia areata. However, on basis of data which are available, my feeling is, it's my personal point of view, that most probably I would expect the highest efficacy from brepocitinib, but there are studies ongoing and probably will get new data soon. These drugs, they may also differ in adverse events, or in general, the JAK inhibitors have a good safety profile, provided that simple rules for the initiation of therapy and for monitorings are followed. I would like to share with you some data about the efficacy of JAK inhibitors in alopecia areata, and when considering a decrease in the SALT score, and just as a reminder, the SALT score is the percentage of the scalp which is not covered by hair, so a decrease in SALT score adjusted by the placebo number, which was 1.4%. The decrease in SALT score is approximately 50% for baricitinib. And when looking at this data from a different point of view, approximately 60% or more than 60% of the patients achieve SALT 90 so this is an improvement of 90%. So more than 60% of patients will have an improvement of 90%. Is this a lot? Well, it depends on the point of view. We always in medicine aim for 100%, which is difficult to achieve in most cases. But when we compare these data to psoriasis, where we have good experience with biological drugs, this would be comparable to most TNF inhibitors. So I think that the data are very promising. A few numbers about baricitinib. This is a little bit different study design. It is a little bit longer, and this is the percentage of patients who achieved SALT-20. SALT-20 is considered almost healthy, meaning that 20% of the scalp is hairless, and many experts believe that it is possible cosmetically to cover the hairless area with the hair which is remaining. And this status of almost healthy was achieved by 52% of patients after 36 weeks. The placebo number is 3.6, and I would like to draw your attention to the placebo numbers. It is here 3.6. In the other study, it was 1.4. And this is the result of having a significant improvement, but not full hair regrowth after placebo. So the old approach to treatment of alopecia areata, wait and see, is not valid because the chance of some regrowth is between 1 and 4% when we look at the study results. 
This is a study which I like a lot because it shows the point of view of the patient. This is the Lupcheriata symptom impact scale. This is a type of a survey which the patient is filling out and there are questions which are related to the perception of the extent of heroes but also to the perception of the emotional impact of a Lupcheriata and here the JAK inhibitors have shown a significant positive impact on the patient's life. In my opinion, the JAK inhibitors have a very significant therapeutic potential in patients with alopecia areata. Most probably, this is what I read from the available data, the two groups which will benefit most from JAK inhibitors are the patients with a short episode of hair loss, which is not longer than approximately, for example, five years, and patients who are children and young adults because they seem to respond best to the therapy. Just an example, this is a study of Tafacetinib in adolescents showing a nice result of hair regrowth in a patient with alopecia areata and an average improvement in these patients in this group was 93%. Conclusion, there are three JAK inhibitors which are being close to being approved for alopecia areata. I hope it will be soon, maybe 2023, maybe 2024. And there are two JAK inhibitors which are available now but they are off-label for alopecia areata. The JAK inhibitors have a good therapeutic efficacy. We will probably need a careful examination of the patients before initiating therapy to exclude possible risk factors. We always, in alopecia areata, need a very long maintenance therapy to prevent the hair loss and the relapse of the disease. And I believe what is most important, we are likely to witness an approval of the first group of drugs which will be dedicated to alopecia areata. If you would like to watch more videos about hair, consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. Thank you very much.